can do it raising your hand at uh, the end of uh, the presentation too. Jim with us on, on the stage. So Jim, please come on, come here with us. Hello, hello, Jim, how are you? Hello, hola, buenos dias, buenas tardes. <laughs> buenas tardes, it depends on where your, you are in the world. Yes, that's, that is one of the great things yeah. about the internet is that it is truly worldwide. Really, really, really great. So, Jim, so uh, as you can see on Wikipedia, you are an American mm -hmm. software engineer. Yes, this is yes, true. Is true. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Who specialize in web, cloud, and open source technology? That's correct. True? So far, it's yeah. two for two. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So Wikipedia is really great with you. So uh, you are the co-founder of the uh, Apache yeah. Software Foundation, a well-known uh, foundation, and a foundation with more than 20 years uh, right now because it was uh, founded in 1998, 1999. In fact, in uh, fact, we actually existed a little bit before that, although we were just called the Apache Group back then. Oh. Okay. Yeah, we, we we can see a photo on on internet with the Apache yes. Apache guys, <laughs> but only it only men, no? There time, were yes. or there were. Okay, and now it would be only women or both, both yes, things. Yes. Big, <laughs> We're trying to increase the uh, diversity very, very much so, as the entire industry is trying to do as well. Yeah. No, we, we try to do so from Open Expo at the same. Uh, we try to, to increase uh, the participation of uh, women in the yeah. technology sector. Uh, we want to, to increase uh, the, this, uh, this thing too. And uh, you were the director of the Open Source Initiative yes, uh, at the same yeah. time. So lots of <laughs> yeah. I wear a lot of different hats <laughs> at a lot of different times over the many, many years that I've been involved, yes. But never a blue hat or Actually, a red hat. Actually, I did or, work for Red Hat in a while. I, I worked for Red Hat for about five ah, yes. years or so. Uh, so yes. Um, okay. Ah, you you're wearing a yes. red red hat too. So. <laughs> and uh, for a little time, no, one month or two months uh, or more or, less, or three. I don't remember. Uh, I I saw that uh, you're in the OSPO. Of, That's right. Uh, yes, Apple. I just joined Uber. I guess maybe about a month and a half ago, joining their open source program office and helping Uber uh, okay. better uh, integrate and consume open source and contribute to it. Okay, so we will say that uh, was okay. in the interview. Uh, talking about OSPO, OSINT, open source, inner source, uh, future, uh, the past in your presentation. So uh, just uh, let you these 25 minutes for your presentation okay. right now. And uh, if you have anything, we are here. You yes. will not see us, okay. but we I are here you. with you. Okay. <laughs> Good luck and enjoy everyone the, the talk yeah. with Jim and uh, do not hesitate to ask questions during the presentation and we will ask to Jim after. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very, luck, very much. Bye-bye. Uh, hello, everyone. Again, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for attending and I especially want to thank everyone for the invitation to, uh, uh, to speak today. Uh, I am incredibly uh, honored and humbled uh, to speak. I've just been very, very lucky um, in my journey, in my experience in open source. And I hope that as part of my uh, talk, I can encourage people and invigorate people to get uh, just as involved uh, in here. So I'm going to share my screen and get the presentation started. Uh, you should be able to see my screen now. Let me just double check and make sure. Yes, yes you can. Uh, so uh, as was mentioned, my talk is called the um, uh, Traveler's Tales, two decades, 20 years, one score of uh, my journey inside of open source. So let's talk a little bit about prehistory, basically, as far as the open source is concerned, before 1999. And we have to remember that back then, software was inexpensive. Software was really not a source of revenue. It wasn't something that you sold. Why was that? Because the computers themselves were so expensive, so rare, that they sort of were 
the software dongles of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Software wasn't what was valuable. It was the computer hardware itself. So software really didn't have any kind of intrinsic value. It was shared. It was something that was worked on collaboratively. That's a, one of the best examples of that, I guess, is looking at the BSD operating system, the Berkeley software distribution. Now, of course, there were two different versions of Unix. Uh, one was the AT&T System 5 and, and variants. But the most popular one, because it was free, because it was shared, because it was something that was collaborated on, was the BSD operating system, which still exists and is still very, very healthy today. But we can see that most of what was going on is because software was not really expensive, wasn't something you needed or wanted to hang on to. It was the computers that made the difference. Also, what was important, and I think we sometimes lose recognition of this fact, is that all of the cornerstones of the internet, even today, were and still are built on what is basically open source, even though it wasn't called that back then, but open source, freely available, freely shared software. Bind, the name, the, the, you know, the domain name operating, the domain name system, which translates between IP addresses and host names. That was all shared and collaborated on. Sendmail and Smail and Qmail, uh, the, the cornerstones, the foundation of the email aspects that uh, was in, in space. Uh, Usenet, TCP IP, Gopher, and FTP. These were all the foundations of the internet. And in all cases, the software that was designed to, in, uh, to make those work, to uh, interoperate between those, to get those things up and running, were basically free open source software. But then what happened? Well, it's what I call the PC revolution. It was back when PCs became smaller, much more of a commodity item, that you were no longer restricted to using a computer system that was extremely large, that required a huge custom-made uh, air conditionally cooled room with a raised floor for all the pipes and wiring beneath it. You could have a computer, a mini computer, running on your laptop, running on the side of your desk. So when that happened, the computers became less expensive. They were no longer the extremely rare, valuable commodities out there. And it became much more rational, much more um, of a business sense to start charging for software. Software became a way of actually creating money, of creating revenue, because the audience, the consumer base for your product was simply much larger than it was back before. Now, when this started happening, some of the people who were used to the old ways of sharing information, of sharing code, of, of you seeing software as something that was really a, a shared resource started getting concerned. And we really have to thank uh, RMS, uh, Richard Stallman, for, for creating and starting the, the free software movement um, and the whole idea of copy left behind there. Basically, the idea was that, hey, let's get back to the way it used to be. Let's get back to the ways where software was free. Now, of course, the free software movement has more than just that. It sees software freedom as a moral imperative um, and is somewhat different from what open source sees it. But really, in part of open source's journey, you have to look at the introduction of the free software movement itself, which was based on four freedoms, four freedoms that software should abide by. So if you're releasing software, if you're contributing to software, if you're producing software, it really should abide by these, these four freedoms. And again, for the English speakers out there, uh, what I mean free as in free speech, not free as in free beer, although free beer is always good. Uh, this is the reason why um, in some areas, 
uh, you're seeing it's talked about as a libre, you know, which is, you know, actually has that distinction in the language. But unfortunately for English speakers, sometimes free gets somewhat confused. And that certainly was an issue in the early days of the free software movement and uh, in open source itself. So again, we're talking about the old days, the old days when all this stuff was free, when all this stuff was 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 uh, up and running, and there was a, uh, a real desire for everything to be shared, for everything to be collaborated on, that you could download the software from someplace, run it on your computer, provide uh, patches and improvements, and they would most probably likely be, be involved. So as things started taking off, as the internet became much more successful, much more commercialized, for lack of a better term, these protocols, these standards became important. But what really kicked off the internet revolution was the introduction of the World Wide Web. This was the thing that really brought the internet to, to everyone out there. And in doing so, it created some incredibly useful software tools, some of them open source and some of them maybe not so open source. For example, at the very beginning, you know, the two main best ways of accessing the internet was basically the open source mosaic web browser and the old NCSA web server. Now, what happened, of course, at this time is that because it was successful, because the internet was becoming commercialized, the people behind Mosaic and the NCSA web server decided we can make a business out of this. We can commercialize this. And that was the result. That was what uh, resulted in, in Netscape, you know, working up and becoming, uh, becoming a company is that this became a commercial viability for them. And then, of course, there was the Linux operating itself, which was also being kicked around at the exact same time. And here was another uh, incredibly useful open source alternative to not only BSD, but the old Sun uh, and Solaris systems out there, which were commercialized, somewhat open source, but not really all open source. And so as more and more people started getting involved, you started seeing the foundations of open source becoming much more important, much more attractive. And in fact, the Apache web server was a direct result of this uh, creation of Netscape. The reason why we created the Apache web server and we created the Apache group is because we were all dependent upon the NCSA web server. And so when the person who was developing that left and joined Netscape, we were dependent upon a piece of software that no one was maintaining anymore, that no one was contributing to. And so we were lucky enough to pull ourselves up and reboot that project as Apache. And that's one of the reasons why Apache has this idea that community is so important because we never want anyone who's dependent upon a free and open source software project to be in the same situation that we were, to have an open source project without a community around it, to have it only being developed by a single company or a single person. And if their interest goes away, you're basically dead in the water. It was also around this time that there were companies also looking on how to commercialize and monetize and maybe even control this free ranging World Wide Web out there. And we can't forget the impact of that at the time that open source booted around. You had these very, very big competing entities. You had the commercial entities seeing the opportunities available if they could get their, their hooks into the internet and the World Wide Web and control it or carve out uh, a portion of it. And you had what would became the open source and free software communities pulling away at that and ensuring that it remained as free and democratic as possible. So it was around 1999 that all this came about, that we saw the huge inrush of FUD, fear, uncertainty and doubt. You saw a lot of companies, some very, very well-known companies, basically declaring open source as a cancer, as sort of like the death of software, the death of innovation. Now, it's unfair to call out Microsoft at this point in time, because right now in the 21st centuries, 
they are one of the largest open source proponents out there with an incredibly um, deeply uh, involved open source program office and heavily involved in the open source community. But back in the 1990s, uh, late 1990s and the early 2000s, they saw it as really something to be avoided, something to challenge, something that threatened them. And so it was really at that time that the open source initiative, OSI, came up. And they said, we need to make sure that these standards, these ideals of what open source is about are not only well known, but also defined, defined in a way that we can say whether or not a license and software is really open source or not. We wanna attack this FUD. We wanna have a, a charter, a mission that we can rally around. And that is what the open source definition, these 10 criteria are. These are basically the defining factors of what defines an open source license. And you cannot be, or you cannot claim to be an open source project if it's not under an open source license. And that open source license does not comply with these 10 criteria and not approved as such by OSI. It was important at this time that we had a real definition of open source and something we could rally around. And you saw a lot of open source foundations, again, kick off at this time. It was in 1999 that we changed from the Apache group an informal collection of people who were just hacking on a web server to the Apache Software Foundation. We knew that for open source to succeed, it needed a house, it needed a home for neutral entities, neutral companies and individual developers and volunteers to work on a software project, to work on an open source software project. And the internet and open source has thrived and grown since then. And you've seen a number of open source foundations grow. Linux Foundation, the Eclipse Foundation, Oasis, Software Freedom Conservancy. These are all entities designed to protect the open source projects, but also protect the ideals of open source and has grown tremendously around the number of years. As I said before, Microsoft, which had been an enemy, is now an ally of, of open source. So, hey, here it is, the year 2020 and open source wins, right? I mean, think of all the technology, think of all the programs, uh, all the code bases that uh, implement and define Web 2 and Web 3 and, and big data and machine learning AI and the whole blockchain technology, even microservices and DevOps and the FinTech FinServe industry. They're all based on the ideas of open source. They are all dependent upon and are rallying around open source implementations of those ideas. And even the idea of, open, of software development best practices are getting their lessons from the open source technology out there, from the open source community. And this is what's creating the topic or the uh, idea of inner source, which is basically treating your internal enterprise software development as is it what as if it was an open source project, focusing on collaboration, focusing on consensus building, focusing on transparency and public access, and we're seeing tons and tons and tons of companies who would not be in existence if it wasn't for open source. Not only contributing to open source, but also consuming open source. It really is worldwide. You can't think of any, uh, any industry, any company, any country that doesn't have open source deep, excuse me, deep within its core. So yes, open source has won, right? Well, has it? Has it really won? I mean, if you've been an aware and involved in the last couple of years, you've noticed some, that some things have happened which have really called that into question. For example, one of the ideals behind open source, because it was developed by the people who used the software, users became contributors, it was very, very much focused on the tech. The tech was what was important, how it did the work, how it, uh, how it solved the problem. But what we've been seeing is a return to what I call hype-driven design or architecture over tech-driven. 
It's not so much about the technology, but how well is it marketed? And of course, open source is a part and parcel of that. Open source is certainly, you know, one of the first bullet points in those presentations. Hey, we have an open source solution, but are they really talking about the tech or is that just some way of getting your interest involved in it? There's also the return of FUD nowadays, especially by people and companies and entities that should know better. We've seen companies rail and complain about their business models not working out right because open source doesn't work anymore. Open source doesn't work for the 21st century. Open source needs to change because, oops, we picked the wrong license. Well, that's really not a problem with open source. It's a problem with your business model. We're seeing non-open source riders and clauses being added on, bolted on to open source licenses to try to resolve that. Common clause, for example, is something which is usually added onto the Apache license, which basically turns a project which is open source into something that really isn't open source. The same with the SSPL. These are all attempts by companies who up until now have been real allies of open source, who have built their business around open source to redefine those defining principles of open source that has caused and allowed open source to be as successful as it is. We're seeing a return to centralization and single points of failure. Remember in the, in the early days of the web and the internet where except for DNS, which had like, you know, 12 main core servers all over the place. If one section of the internet went down or one internet provider company went down, the rest of the internet continued to work right. That's certainly not the day way it is right now. You can count easily the number of companies that if there is an outage for half an hour, how many people that, that, that changes. And that idea that, Recentralization of power and resources is kind of the anathema, the opposite of what the internet and the World Wide Web is about. And we're seeing the, the growth of what I call facade foundations, foundations which really aren't about a neutral, safe uh, place for people and organizations to combine, but just a way to have marketing aspects inside of there. The internet, the open source, was all about controlling your own destiny because you had direct access to the source code that you required to get your business done. If history has shown us anything, history has shown that when there are successful revolutions, when power is being um, reabsorbed by the people, those people in powerful positions try to stop that from happening. So really, the last 20 years of open source has been very, very successful, but we have not totally completely won. There is still a lot more to be done. We need to keep the revolution going. It's important to foster a new generation. You look around, you know, some of the leaders of open source nowadays, and even though I'm most probably on the upper end of that age scale, when we all started off, we were much younger. Okay, we need to have fresh people, fresh blood, fresh ideas looking into this. And it's up to us to be able to do that. So my takeaway from this, and this is a perfect opportunity because of the setup that we have here at Open Expo with the Q&A sections and the, and the tables and the chats and the infrastructure that's in here. Be a mentor and find a mentor. Let's keep this going on. Let's join in, not only as people, but as people who are interested in keeping this revolution going. Let's continue to drive this revolution, but most important, let's remember to also have fun while we're doing it. This should be fun, it is fun. There's this old idea that developers and engineers are solitary creatures who are more comfortable in the basements of their houses or in a dark room with a green screen monitor in front of them. But what we have shown, what's easily seen is that developers, engineers are artists. They wanna hone and share their skill, their craft, which is code. That's fun to do. 
Open source provides that opportunity. Open source releases those floodgates. And that's why we've seen open source become successful, as well as open source being the catalyst of innovation. So at the end of the day, it is all about having fun. And I encourage everyone to keep the fun alive and thriving inside of open source. So I thank you everyone for, for attending and listening. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I ask everyone to please stay safe, hug your families and have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your presentation. Uh, just uh, receive a uh, Gemma for the interview part of uh, with, uh, with him. Thank Hello. you for the presentation. Thanks. Thank you. you very much. <laughs> you, you, you can simulate an applause with raise your hand. So raise, <laughs> raise your hand <laughs> to to make an applause to. Wow. Jim, thank you very much for, you. for your time, thank you for much. your knowledge, and and now we will ask you uh, some questions. Sure. Uh, first of all, just uh, remind people that they can uh, ask questions directly through the Q and A on the right part of your screen, and if someone wants to come here in the stage with us, you can come with us. And I will stage. also be hanging around for the next several hours as well. So if anyone has questions after the fact. Just uh, you know, join whatever table I'm at, and feel free to to ask away. Okay, thank you very much. So we will start uh, the interview uh, with some questions right now from the the audience uh, before starting uh, with uh, our own questions. Sure. So first of all, I will read the first one and let the second one for Gemma. So, what project do you prefer that you have participated in? Which do you love more? Um, I would have to say that it's always difficult, <coughs> excuse me, it's always difficult to forget your first love. And for me, it is the Apache web server. It, it is what really got me uh, really involved in, a, in open source at the very, very beginning. As I said before, as I alluded to in my uh, presentation, um, I had been uh, developing and using the NCSA web server. And when Rob McCall, the author, went to join Netscape. Um, I was dependent upon that, and that's what you know got me involved with the Apache group. If it hadn't been for Apache, I don't think I would be as involved uh, as I am right now. I don't think I would be as, as known. And I still code on the Apache web server. Up until very, very recently, I was one of the uh, release managers for it. So it's still, um, it still holds a, 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 a special place in my heart. Plus, it's, it's written in C. And I love the C programming language. I, I, I love a whole bunch of programming languages, but uh, I learned first in C. And again, it's a great opportunity to uh, keep those skills alive. Really good choice for the C. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK, the next question we have for the, the audience is, what about open office? Open office. Oh, that's a very, very good question. I know there's a there's a lot, and I am involved in in open office. In fact, I am the release manager for uh, for Apache uh, Open Office. Uh, and the reason why is that I don't see Open Office myself as a competitor uh, to LibreOffice. Uh, LibreOffice is just as far as features and capabilities, you know, far beyond what Open Office is or is designed to be. Actually. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, places, uh, a lot of people who can't afford the latest and greatest software out there. There are a lot of people who are still running on 386 PCs, you know, running old versions of Linux or Windows or, or even Apples and things of that nature. Um, but they still should have access to uh, uh, to an office suite, being able to do, you know, presentations and, and documents and, and spreadsheets and things like that way. Uh, and so open office is designed to fill that niche. Uh, open Office is designed to be as 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 core as possible to have as many people as possible who with low end machines be able to run in, run on top of it. So that's the reason why Open Office still exists. That's the reason why um, you know it's still important to uh, uh, to Apache to myself and all the other Open Office contributors is that we see a uh, a, a, a disservice niche of people. Who are being well served by by OpenOffice currently? 
For the next question, we will invite uh, Etienne, Etienne Zana, uh, maybe to, to come here. He has put it a question on, on the chat. So please, hello, hi. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> hi, hi, Jim. Hi. Hey. Um, so you, you were talking about how open source used to be, you know, the heart of the battle a few years ago uh, between people who were used to sharing software and new companies coming to the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, I live in the US and it seems that these days uh, the battle is uh, around net neutrality. It seems to be the big topic. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you see a link between the two. And if you think that uh, if the net neutrality battle is lost, it's going to have any sort of impact on the uh, open source movement? Yeah, that, that's a great, a great question. Yes, because um, I, I think there is. And I think it gets back to my somewhat, uh, you know, when I talked about power structure, you know, uh, you know, the Internet, again, was all about decentralization, you know, um, you know, of of technology and messaging, you know, uh, but also that only makes sense if the data itself is is decentralized uh, as much as possible uh, net neutrality i think is is very very important to that and i think the reason why there are companies looking to remove net neutrality is because it benefits them financially you know the more that you can control something especially something which should be and is really a commodity for the general populace the more you have a, sort of like a, a monopoly or monopoly control over it you know, the better it is for you and your shareholders and your stock price and your bonus structure later on. We have to remember that early, I'm, I'm old enough to remember this, but early on when the internet was just taking off, you were not allowed to use it for commercial uses. There was actually a restriction that you couldn't use it for providing business functions and things like that. It was for educational research, academic research. So even from the very, very beginning, the idea that the internet was something that could be or should be commercialized and monetized was something that was anti, you know, wasn't something that we wanted to have. Uh, so I, I am definitely a big uh, advocate of ensuring net neutrality because I think it's important for the, the reach and the usage uh, and to again, make it a, a common flat level playing field that all people of all economic stations at all areas of the environment, all areas of the world can use, share, and leverage. And I, and I think that that open source uh, has the, the tools and certainly the community passion to be able to provide help, insight, um, and um, you know, aid in, in driving that message across. All right, thank Same. you. Thank you very much, Etienne. Do you want to, to stay with us until the end of the interview? No, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll stick around, but I don't need to be on stage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if someone wants to come, come here with the stage with us, uh, just raise your hand and you will come here on the stage. Like Etienne, thank you very much for Etienne. See you, bye-bye. Cheers. Bye, Etienne. We have another question now. Okay. What is the difference between Apache and GPL licenses? Ah, what is the difference between Apache and GPL license? There are actually two types of GPL license. There is the uh, uh, the weak copyleft license, uh, which are like the LGPL, the Eclipse uh, public license. And there is the strong copyleft license, like the GPL or the AGPL. Um, the main differences are, is that the Apache license were all permissive licenses like the Apache license, BSD, MIT. Um, they're free to be shared. You can use them however you want. Uh, if you make changes or modifications to that uh, to that code base, to that uh, project, and you distribute uh, the software out there to other people, if you give it to other people, you don't necessarily need to make those changes public. You can keep those changes private. So if, if you want to take, for example, the Apache web server, and add stuff on top of it to make it more, you know, uh, enterprise ready and sell that, you can. Um, and you can keep those bits and pieces that you yourself have created proprietary um, and non-public and they do not have to be released under an open source license at all. Uh, copyleft is designed to prevent that from happening. Copyleft is designed that any changes or modifications made to a project should also be available under that license. So if you take something which is GPL 
you modify it, change it, and you sell it, for example, well, those modifications also have to be available to anyone who wants them under a GPL license. It prevents you from being able to take that and make those proprietary. And those are basically the same ideas. Again, the reasons why is because from a, from a free software aspect, um, software freedom is a moral imperative. Software should always be free, whereas permissive licenses take a somewhat more pragmatic and practical approach, seeing that there are times and situations where software needs to be or should be proprietary and non-open. And that's the difference between you know, the Apache license and, and copyleft licenses. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we, 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 we prepared questions for the interview, but <laughs> the time is nearly finished. And we, 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 <laughs> we didn't start, but it's really a great moment because uh, I think it's better to answer question from the audience than question from, from us. Okay. So it's perfect. And if you want, someone wants to enjoy uh, Jim, uh, questions, knowledge, uh, just let us know and raise your hand or, or ask us through the Q&A. And just before having a question, the last question from the audience, uh, I would like to know a little bit more on the uh, Herber, Herber Ospo because uh, you entered this uh, one month and a half ago. Yes. Uh, why and what for? Oh, that's, and, a, that's a and... great question. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, uh, what I love about open source is the way that it, you know, first of all, that it, um, you know, makes people aware that software development is an art form, you know, and it provides the opportunity for collaboration and people to share their skills. Um, but also, it's a great way of driving innovation inside of companies. You know, companies by consuming open source as well as contributing to open source, they're able to save their um, developer resources, their developer talent to work on the, we call it special sauce inside the company. These are the things that differentiate the company, make a company special from its developers. And being able to provide the, the background and the experience that I have to a company like Uber, who is really ramping up their open source engagement. Uh, we've been releasing several open source projects out there um, and, and driving our open source awareness. It was just a great opportunity for me to join what is already an existing great team inside of Uber, but also the mission of Uber is all about empowering people by providing you know, transportation, you know, uh, you know, the ability to to move, to migrate, you know, that is an empowering thing for people. Um, and so the mission of Uber aligns with the mission of open source, which is empowering people to share software and drive innovation. Okay, so we, we have three minutes to uh, finish the interview. Just let me ask you uh, another question the last question sure ah, uh, no there is a question from the audience so just right now uh, oh. Oh, if you want to ask Rema this this question okay. Yeah, because, okay do you think that Microsoft should have released Windows 7 source code after the FSF petition as they did with XP um, you know what I mean it's kind of hard without knowing everything that's in Windows 7, being able to say whether or not, so there have been times at the various companies that I worked for that we had gone and, you know, taken something that we worked on internally that was never intended to be released publicly. And there's a lot of stuff inside there, inside of comments and the way you're developing code and stuff like that, that, um, you know, just isn't suitable for public release. I mean, you've got to go and clean things. You know, uh, open source is all about, you know, hanging your laundry out on the clothesline for all your neighbors to see. Um, and sometimes you need to take time to make sure that, you know, old code is removed, you know, things of that nature. I think that if, uh, if Microsoft had enough time and resources to be able to do that sort of due diligence, and clean up anything that may or could be inside of Windows 7 and release it, I think they would have done that. Okay, thank you very much. We are just right on time, one minute to go. So just the time to say uh, thank you very much. 
to say uh, goodbye and I, I will go in the table. I will follow you on, on okay. each table <laughs> to, to okay. ask you all my questions okay. <laughs> of, the, uh, of the interview. I will follow you during two hours. Okay. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> so just let people know that, uh, that uh, between uh, talk and talk or between interview and interview, uh, they can network on each table. Uh, this is the platform. The platform uh, allows to do this. So Please do it. Uh, just put your camera on, put your mic, and uh, network with Jim, for example. Just follow Jim. <laughs> We all follow Jim <laughs> on the table. <laughs> on the table. So thank you very much. I let you with uh, Gemma, uh, the presenter of uh, this room for all this uh, afternoon uh, in European time or morning in US time. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much to everyone. And thank you, Jim. Bye bye. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And everybody stick around. Have a great uh, have a great day and have a great uh, have a great event. Yeah, we will follow you in the table. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Bye -bye. Jim. And now you have 15 minutes to network and then we will have Frederick Descamp here with us. So enjoy the networking and see you soon. <laughs>